Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, no one has the power to give away a piece of Somalia. Mogadishu vows to defend its territorial integrity after a destabilizing deal that's seen the breakaway Somaliland gain Ethiopia's recognition in exchange for access to the Red Sea. Also, as the continent's footballing heavyweights prepare to strap on their boots for the kickoff of the Africa Cup of Nations in just a couple of weeks' time, street traders in Ivory Coast said that they're already losing out big time as they're being forced to wrap up trade to sit the event out. And beyond the physical, the Nigerian wrestling ring becomes a lens through which to explore the country's unique history and culture. Back in the 70s, the fight was seen as a way to battle for a more prominent Afrocentric identity, and its popularity continues to this day. We take a closer look. But first, Somalia's lashed out at landlocked Ethiopia after Addis Ababa struck a deal with the separatist territory of Somaliland swapping formal recognition for access to the Red Sea port of Bebra. Now, the move has stung all the more for having come just days after Mogadishu had itself agreed to restart stalled talks with the breakaway region of Somaliland. At a planned emergency meet, at, a, at an emergency parliamentary session on Tuesday, Somalia accused Ethiopia of betrayal and of assaulting its sovereignty. Our regional correspondent, Bastien Renoui, tells us more. Mogadishu recalled its ambassador in Addis Ababa, and in the meantime, Somalia's cabinet held an emergency meeting during which Prime Minister Barre called on the United Nations, the Arab League, and the African Union to support Somalia's right to defend itself. Somalia, Somalia, Somalia belongs Somalia, to Somalis. That is our stance. We will die for that cause and will defend every location where Somalis belong to. To understand the situation in the Horn of Africa, I need to give you a bit of context. In 1991, Somaliland declared its independence from Somalia. Since then, it has never been recognized by any country, and it's desperately looking for some support. On the other side, Ethiopia is a landlocked country. During the past year, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said several times that the country needs access to the sea. On Monday, both Somaliland and Ethiopian government uh, announced that they reached an agreement that Somaliland will allocate some lands next to the port of Berbera on the shores of the uh, Gulf of Aden for Ethiopia to build a military base that will give it access uh, to uh, the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. And in exchange, Ethiopia will soon recognize a Somaliland independence. And both of these announcements are unacceptable for Mogadishu. In an address to the nation, Prime Minister Barre said that uh, he remained committed to uh, protect, to defend uh, the lands of uh, Somalia. Uh, he called on the population to uh, remain calm. But many in the region believe that these are threats to uh, Ethiopia and Somaliland. Bastien Renoui there for us. Now, Israel has said that it will defend itself against genocide charges brought by South Africa at the International Court of Justice. At the end of last week, Pretoria launched the case in a bid to get the World Court to order Israel to stop its attacks on Gaza. Now, South Africa has accused Israel of a disproportionate response to the killing of over 1,400 people in Israel by Hamas extremists late last year. Since then, around 22,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israel's onslaught since October. Israel rarely engages in cases brought before the UN court, but says that South Africa's charges are ridiculous. Giving political and legal cover to the October 7 massacre and the Hamas human shield strategy, South Africa has made itself criminally complicit with Hamas's campaign of genocide against our people. It shares culpability for the tragic loss of human life. The State of Israel will appear before the International Court of Justice at The Hague to dispel South Africa's absurd blood libel. How tragic that the rainbow nation that prides itself on fighting racism will be fighting pro bono for anti-Jewish racists. We have no doubt that after the Jewish state brings to justice the perpetrators of the bloodiest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, history will judge South Africa for abetting the modern heirs of the Nazis. The countdown to AFCON continues, the African Cup of Nations. Now, there's less than two weeks to go until it kicks off in Ivory Coast. And the final preparations are underway in Yamasuko, Ivory Coast. Infrastructure and access points have all been spruced up. 
but street sellers have been asked to make themselves scarce, which is a huge blow for the sector. Our correspondents tell us more. Yamusukro, the administrative capital of Côte d'Ivoire. Abdul and his team are in charge of handing out warnings. Within a week, these informal buildings will be demolished. It's estimated that more than 500 shopkeepers will be affected throughout the city, especially those with shops along the main roads leading to the stadium. For Ella, the owner of this small grocery shop, the news is worrying. I'm so upset. Since I've been asked to leave, I don't know how I'm going to survive. She says the decision to relocate here is unfair. I pay both taxes, the flat rate tax and the tax for occupying a public space. If the town hall didn't want to, it wouldn't ask us to pay taxes. As soon as they accept the taxes, it means that they agree to us setting up here. Bukhari went into debt to set up this small restaurant. He says his restaurant complies with the regulations on the occupation of public spaces. When we arrived on site here, nothing had been done. The state hadn't even built the gutters. We built the gutters ourselves. We went to the bank and took out 27,000 euros. The authorities in Yamusukru say these measures are necessary. We're all under a security threat particularly the threat of terrorism. We have to make sure that none of these unhealthy places allow people with bad intentions to gather around the roads. The Ministry of Sanitation and Hygiene has organized similar campaigns in several cities hosting the African Cup of Nations, notably in the working class neighborhoods of Ajame and Abobo in Abidjan. Now, Nigerian traditional wrestling goes beyond the physical practice. Once to practice to buy villagers to mark the end of harvest, the fight was then later recognized as a professional sport in the 70s under the military regime of Sini Kunchi. He wanted to promote athletes' skills as an Afrocentric reflection of Nigerian identity. Clarice Fortuné tells us more. A little dance before the big moment. And now it's time to focus. The annual wrestling tournament in the northern city of Agadez is more than just a sporting event. The wrestlers finally face each other, carried by the beat of traditional Sugulu music. Now in its 44th year, the national Sabah competition comes after a turbulent year for Niger, which saw military officers seize power on July 26. But for 10 days, those troubles are forgotten, as all eyes are on the skill and maneuvers of the wrestlers. In Niger, traditional wrestling is the king's sport, it's the most loved. We inherit it from our ancestors, so it's normal that people cling to this traditional sport, which unites Nigerians. Thanks to wrestling, we all know each other, we build solid relationships, we form a family, it's the cement of unity. The winner falls to his knees. After just eight minutes, his opponent's knee and elbow have touched the sand handing Isaka Isaka an historic win, his third consecutive title at the Sabre and the sixth of his career. Once practiced by villagers to mark the end of the harvest, traditional wrestling seems to resist the test of time, whatever the odds and political turmoil. Well, Ivory Coast's Villa Alvira has been cooking up a storm with its Afro-fusion vision. Blending local flavours and visions with inspirations from around the globe, chefs have whetted the appetite of customers of all backgrounds. Take a look. Revisiting Ivorian cuisine with a modern twist. This is the aim of chef Charlie Kofi, who has been busy behind the stoves of his restaurant, La Villa Alvira, since 2017. One of his flagship dishes, an interpretation of the guaguasu sauce, emblematic of Ivory Coast. These are recipes that I enjoyed so much as a child, so naturally revisiting them was quite something. It's almost an obligation as a chef. The 30-year-old learned the trade in Bordeaux, France, before returning to his homeland. For him, tradition and creativity go hand in hand. I've been able to make some changes to my creations while using local products and flavors. 
In fact, the real point is the flavors. As long as the flavors are familiar to the palate, the Ivorian will find flavors that he knows. From that point, he'll easily follow you in your new direction. A winning choice, according to his customers. It's practically the same flavors, but there is some boldness. There is a real boldness in the decoration, in the mix of certain spices, certain vegetables. And he is not the only one who thinks so. According to the organization Chefs Who Create Culinary Emotions in Ivory Coast, since the mid-2000s, more and more chefs based across the country have been revisiting local dishes. And they're doing it even in high-end restaurants. Even if our cuisine is meant to be international because we're a five-star hotel, I think it's nonsense not to give a nod to all the beautiful products that surround us. According to the organization, in addition to the financial benefits that local cuisine brings, there is a genuine desire from Ivorian chefs to put national dishes on the map of international gastronomy. I need some more culinary emotion in my own cooking. It's definitely, I'm not stepping up enough. <laughs> that is, though, all we have time for for Eye on Africa for now. Thanks for joining us, though. Do so again if you can. Till then, take care. France 24, your window on the world. Liberté, égalité, actualité.